Just as we took the break, Ruth, I was thinking about when you introduce a traumatized person to their brain, and these are people who tend to act out, and one of the things that we may have come to a better understanding of is what the acting out mm -hmm. is. I mean, there's this, there's What a lot do you of mean by acting out? I never like that phrase because I never understand what, it's, what it means also when people say this is behavioral. I always ask them, I say, what do you mean by behavioral? And they can never answer my question, so. Well, maybe I can't either. <laughs> but let, let me just, let me make this point and then we'll get there, yeah. okay? That it's shoplifting. Let's just, let's just take that as an example and okay. we'll just call that acting out because you give it a dynamic meaning, it will be acting something out. You want to get caught or you, I don't know, whatever yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. You're hungry, symbolic representation mm -hmm. of yeah. that, so you're going to yeah. steal. But what we are really talking about is a certain kind of liveliness, that, a liveness that comes on mm -hmm. board mm -hmm. in situations of risk and threat. And so you can put yourself in them. Absolutely. Either without awareness or, if we call that purposely, purposely. You know, you can, right. It's actually a symptom of post-traumatic stress. Which is? Reckless behavior. Oh, reckless behavior. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and it can be looked at as a lack of prefrontal shutdown or of inhibition in the brain terms. And what I am wanting to, to talk about just for a moment is what happens when you start to introduce your patient to their brain mm -hmm. in terms of the notion of secondary gain. Because secondary gain is a big player in the way people conceptualize these patients. They have to get rewarded somehow for their yeah. behavior and that's the secondary gain. They get attention or they get attention. <laughs> it's getting attention, it seems to me, is a secondary mm -hmm. game. And of course, attention is something traumatized individuals never had, exactly. right? And often they had to take such extreme measures to get into attention because they weren't noticed, right? That's so I right. think when you see that, it, that always needs to be at the back of your mind when you're trying to understand certain patterns of behavior. Yeah, and to stay patient with them. Absolutely. Right? And the Absolutely. more that you can introduce them to the fact that this is an activation strategy. Let's just say mm -hmm. that they were right about all yeah. of this, right? And that shoplifting is just going to be our metaphor. Yeah. That shoplifting is an attempt to, to stay out of the dead zone. Yeah right, is to move out of the death feigning into, because I really think that's what it is, into activation. Um, Connecting and, your default mode network. And, and becoming, right, for, the, yeah. for, the, for yeah. that moment of time that you're engaged in this behavior, you're in a becoming state. You're, you're, uh, and once that becomes the raison d'etre of the behavior, the secondary gain, in as much as there is some, mm -hmm. just drops away. It's much better understood in brain activation than it is to me in attention seeking, although there's plenty of reason that people would seek attention. But it is more primarily understood in this sense of how do I stay alive? Mm -hmm. How do I activate a mm -hmm. sense of myself? And that the need to keep doing it once that is, is recognized and recognized as that's what your brain is mm -hmm. driving you to do, I just think it changes the dynamic, not only the way that therapists understand their patients, but the way that patients will understand their, their own behaviors. And it kind of takes the kick out of it. I mean, there is an excitement factor. Mm -hmm. It's not just adrenaline. Mm -hmm. There is an excitement factor in that whole kind of sneak thief kind of mm -hmm. orientation of the body-mind. Which you're only able to feel under extreme stimulation, right? The stimulus needs to be so extreme, and this is what I hear from a lot of traumatized individuals. You hear it from the veterans as well, right? That in order to feel that excitement, to feel alive because they feel so numbed out and so dead, they talk about this all the time, mm -hmm. in order to feel something, the stimulus needs to be so strong. It, 
essentially needs to be a stimulus that resembles reckless behavior in order to, yeah, to bring to, those networks online right. and to feel something and to have some resemblance of a feeling of a sense of self. Right, right. right. So, yeah, I think that's just incredibly important to be understood. Absolutely, and when we ask about reckless behavior now, which we do all the time, I think we really need to understand that. Similar uh, self-mutilation, right? That also has an extensive neurobiology that has been studied by a number of groups around the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a Can you summarize it? Yeah, absolutely. For example, uh, in people who have behaviors of self-mutilation and who have experiences of decreased pain when they hurt themselves, they have decreased amygdala activation. And that also seems to be associated with increases in dissociative experiences. So the less amygdala activation they have during pain processing and the less they feel pain, the more dissociative symptoms seem to be present. And so that may very much relate to the decreased ability to feel pain when you're cutting and again, using that stimulus to bring online these networks that help you to feel a sense of self, to help you to feel alive. Mm -hmm. Also those prefrontal areas. Well, there's a whole buildup that happens and that my, some of my patients describe and that I definitely remember. It's a long time ago. But there's a whole buildup that is in the excitement arena toward the act of self-harm. Absolutely. You know, and the self-harm is almost secondary. Yeah. You know, it's the denouement. Yeah. It's not the height of the drama. Yeah. The, the, the build-up to that has been, and, and you can feel it in the viscera. Yeah. I mean, you can feel it in your belly, you can feel it in your throat, you can feel it as you're building toward this climax, is the word, word I was thinking, of the act itself. But the act itself is denouement. Yeah. And people will often then report, you know, at least I felt alive. It brought me back, right? I felt something, even if it's only for a small period of and time. And it is a very small period yeah. of time. And of course, another reason for self-mutilation can be if people don't have words to describe their feelings, which is also so common in traumatized individuals, right? That they have this alexithymia, as we call it, or this inability to s describe what you feel in words and mm -hmm. an inability to know what you're feeling begin because you're cut off from your body. Yeah, and in my experience, it was not only, I mean, this is also very hard to put into words, Yeah. right? It's not even that I would have lacked the words, but then there has to be the receiver for the words. And so that has to make some sense. And if that becomes Oedipal, or I don't know what else, you know, if it becomes uh, behavioral reinforcement, mm -hmm. it is not received. And then you're replicating the same early process yeah, that in you're not therapy. Heard. That, that, and for so much of this, it does feel too, is so much is stirring up that is nonverbal, that is impossible to put into words. People say it all the time. There are no words for this. So sometimes self-mutilation can also be a way of expressing Literal. distress, letting people see the internal pain. Right? Yeah, letting people see it and also, I think it can be quite literal. I am on fire. Put out the fire. Mm -hmm. That is only one step away from the reality of their nervous system. You know, it's the closest communication, mm -hmm. but it has to be put into words. Mm -hmm. It can't be acted out. Absolutely. People die or disfigure themselves. But again, that's why we need to calm that nervous system. Exactly. Or it, calm is probably the wrong word because it needs to be regulated both ways, right? We need to help well, people reach a new steady state yeah. where the nervous system is more regulated, yeah. right? And by the very motion of your hands, it suggests that, you know, it, it's not really homeostatic, but it is flexing. It is the ability to flex with the environment yeah. that is just gone. Absolutely. The only thing that I would say in one model of understanding 
collectively all symptoms is in arousal, right? So in neurofeedback language, it's high arousal, low arousal, or mixed high and low arousal, or instability of arousal. So those four mm -hmm. possibilities. What we find is that, and I warn people about this, that are new to trauma but new to neurofeedback, is that you can have somebody present in the death feigning, and it can look like very low arousal, mm -hmm. but sitting right under that, is very high arousal. The yeah. original condition. Yeah, that preceded it. Yeah, yeah, is gonna be about the threat to survival, the threat to the integrity of the and capacity survival. to survive. Yeah, absolutely. And that is never a low arousal at first. No. So, you know. And I, that's the defense cascade curve, right? That you always begin with fight or flight. That may only last a split second because it's not adaptive in that situation it, it because can't you can't be get out, but you always go through that phase before mm -hmm. you enter the other phases. Right. Right. right, and so I'm saying to people, even when the presentation is in the, cas the downward cascade and this person is lumpish mm -hmm. and hardly communicating beneath that emotional catatonia or actual catatonia, there is a state of high arousal. And if you train the brain to arouse itself, to mm -hmm. wake up in the typical way that mm -hmm. neurofeedback is thought of, reinforce higher frequencies of mm -hmm. function, of brain function, then you're going to have the, the real likelihood that you will activate fear circuits and you'll get into fight and flight. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna be, as a therapist, the person who is activating that. Mm -hmm which has got all of its own implications, right? So that's a whole other discussion, probably not even for this round, about what are the neurofeedback implications for all this but in terms of therapy and neurofeedback together. And of course, something a lot of people will be familiar with is the optimum window of tolerance and that we're really trying to widen that optimum window of tolerance, right? Mm -hmm. So people spend less time either hyper too hyper aroused or too hypo aroused, but to widen that window through whatever modality we're using, may that be neurofeedback and a combination of other modalities, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's so, so important to realize that we're really trying to widen that window of tolerance. Yeah, right, right, yeah. I would agree, I would agree. Yeah. Until things that trigger don't trigger, it's a, a very important uh, metaphor, the window of tolerance, and it doesn't really do justice to how we get to those states, right? Right, well, ha well, not only how we get to them, but what once you have a greater window of tolerance, it isn't even then about a window of tolerance. It is about living in the world, world. as it is. Yeah. And, and being uh, able to think, being yeah. able to feel, oh, sorry, being able to be in a relationship, right? Being able to function at work, which you can't when you're outside that window. Exactly, yeah. exactly.